This morning, if you are visiting with us, welcome. We are glad that you are here. We would ask that you please fill out one of the attendance cards in the pew in front of you. We'd like to have a record of your visit. <clears throat> this morning, our brother Walter will be teaching on the law of laziness uh, from the pulpit out of Proverbs chapter 20. So we'll be singing a lot about a working for the Lord and being a worker. Our first song is not in the book, but it's on the screen. Believe it or not, it's not in the book. It's a good old standard, so we're going to sing it, okay? I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. I want to sing and pray and be busy every day in the vineyard of the and love in the kingdom of the Lord. I will work and pray in the vineyard, in the vineyard of the Lord. I will work, I will pray, I will labor every day in the vineyard of the Lord. I want to be a worker strong sing this song we learn what we pray. <coughs> Ladies. Angry words oh let them never fall my tongue. Love one another, the 
study your word, learn more about you, apply it to our lives to affect other people. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for this congregation. We thank you for the work that's done in this area. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you continue to be with those in this congregation, continue to be with the work that we do here. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for your Son, we thank you for his willingness to come to this earth, to live a perfect life, to be a, an example to us, but then to die a cruel death for our sins. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to understand the price that was paid for our souls. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for those that serve in the military that protect our freedoms. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to appreciate that. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, those that are serving, that you keep them safe, you keep them within the hold of your hand, and bring them back to their families safe. We're mindful, dear Heavenly Father, of the many that are in this congregation that are not doing well physically. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you be with each and every one of them. We ask that you be with those that administer to them, and that they might gain portion of their health back would be your will that they could be among our number. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for those that, that serve here. We thank you for the elders and the deacons and the great work that they do. Continue to bless them and help us to make it easy and not a burden to them. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for life. We thank you for the opportunities that we have. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to take those opportunities and make the best of them to expand your kingdom here. We ask as we go through this hour that you forgive us of the things that we do, the, the sins that we have in our lives. Help us to confess them to you. Forgive us of the things we do wrong. We ask all these things in your precious Lord's name, Jesus Christ. Number 313, please. 313. <clears throat> we'll sing the song before taking the Lord's Supper. Make sure you look up before we sing the chorus. I may not sing it every time. We may not sing it every time, okay? <clears throat> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for Someday for a 
So despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb who left his glory above to Mary to Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. during service, pass out communion trays, uh, lead singing, do announcements, do communion. And my father was on that rotation, so it was, they have so many members there, it's really only once every three or four months you have to do something. So once every three or four months, my dad would lead communion on Sunday morning. And wouldn't you know it, when I was in high school, every Super Bowl Sunday, <laughs> he happened to be the one leading communion, and this is his line, every time. He would say, around the world, around the country today is known as Super Sunday. But here at the church, we know it's just another Super Sunday. And I would laugh because I thought that was funny. I was in high school. That's corny. What a dad thing to say. <laughs> but looking back, you know, uh, I um, am a proponent that Super Bowl Sunday should be a national holiday. This is one of my... <laughs> I don't even like... Listen to me. I don't even like the NFL. I don't really care that much about NFL football. But it is a cultural monument. People all across our country gather together. They'll take off work. They'll host Super Bowl parties. And everyone will gather in homes. People across the country, millions of people will gather together around the topic, around the subject of this football game. And, they'll hang, and that should, that's a cultural monument. And we should celebrate that, I think. I think it should be a national holiday. And the more I think about it, uh, you know, and I've made this point before, how in different churches have different meeting times. Some churches meet at 9, some meet at 10.30 like us. Some churches have multiple services, one at 8 and then one at 10. And so it's not exactly the same. But And there's also the issue of time zones being different. But for the most part, every Sunday, people across the country and people across the world gather together 
they take time out of their days, out of their mornings, and they meet together under the premise of serving Jesus as opposed to meeting for a football game. In fact, people, millions of people meet together across the country for the Super Bowl, but across the world, hundreds of millions, I'd say, meet for Jesus. What a phenomenon. What a monument. What a memorial to our Lord. And they meet to worship Jesus, and they meet to do this. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also spoke, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us proclaim the Lord's death today as every other Sunday. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for another Super Sunday. We are thankful to be your children. We are thankful that your son died for our sins. We seek to honor him and we seek to honor you. Let us do so in a manner pleasing unto you. In Christ's name, amen. Father in heaven, uh, we continue to pray, we continue to proclaim your son's death, and now as we consume uh, this cup that represents his blood, uh, we are mindful of his innocence, we are mindful of our own guilt, and we are mindful of how only this cup and only your son's blood can wash away that guilt. We seek to honor you and we seek to worship you, and we seek to serve you. Please let us do this in a manner pleasing unto you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. that marks the conclusion of the Lord's Supper, but as we do every week, this is a convenient time to remind everyone about the collection that this church does. Um, we have all been blessed immensely and immeasurably, um, and Paul requests and scripture requests that we all look at our hearts, inspect our own wealth, inspect our own blessing, and from that abundance, give back, um, in this instance, to this church here. <clears throat> so that we can do administrative things, <clears throat> excuse me, so that we can help serve people in our communities, so that we can help support those missionaries and evangelists across the world. And so with that being said, uh, let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the blessings you've given us. Thank you for our life, our health, uh, the breath in our lungs, the shirts on our backs, and the roofs over our heads. We thank you for everything you've given us, and if we took the time to thank you for everything you've given us, we'd be here all day. So with that being said, we offer you thanks and that you would guide our hearts to be willing to give back to you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.
If you are following along with songbooks, the invitation song will be number 414, 414. Put your marker there. That will be our song of encouragement at the proper time. Before our lesson, we'll sing number 654, 654. If you have a child that's between the ages of 2 and 5 and you are interested in a child to go to a class, well, the lesson is being presented here in the auditorium. Make your way down the hallway, last classroom on your right. Also, at the end of the hallway, we do have a Spanish-speaking service, and you can take a part of that also if you would like to be uh, singing songs and spiritual hymns in, in Spanish and also hearing a message from the Word in Spanish. 654, all that we're able to, please stand. <clears throat> Are you dwelling in the sunlight? Is your path with roses strewn? Do you walk with buoyant gladness in the steps that you have hewn? Have you reached the top of Pisgah, climbing always firm and true? Don't forget. There is someone needing you. Lend a hand to help a brother who is striving hard and true. Don't forget that in the valley there is someone needing you. Is your day one round of pleasure from the morn to set a sun? Know you not of pain or sorrow? Are your victories all won? Lend a hand to help your brother who is struggling hard and true. Don't forget. needing you. Lend a hand to help a brother who is striving hard and true. Don't forget that in the valley there is someone needing you. Sweet it is Sunlight, where the never rise, where the balmy, wafting breezes kiss the blue or hanging skies. But there's always in the shadow some more chapter of the fourth verse. A lazy man will not plow because of winter. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. <laughs> well, good morning to all of you. Those of you that have joined us online, welcome, and we are glad that you were connected with us. This morning, the PowerPoint that you will be seeing was done by Jordan Bennett. She did all this with very little assistance, and we're proud of her for 
doing this as part of Labs to Leaders and Leaderettes. This is part of a year-round program. And so she too, as a young lady, is developing her skills for service in the future within the kingdom amongst ladies. I want to talk about the law of laziness. <clears throat> it might be said that there is an uh, epidemic in America today. In fact, it may be all over the world, but I haven't visited those other parts in many years. <clears throat> Proverbs is a book full of great pieces of wisdom. As Solomon was given not only wisdom, but understanding of how to be a great king and be able to inspire and lead his people. And he speaks of a problem that is not only relevant to the people, but to the kingdom itself. Individuals and how in the kingdom they were affecting the very aspects of progress because of laziness and idleness. We're going to get most of our text from Proverbs 20. Put your ribbon there. But on occasion, like now, I want to take you to another reading. In Proverbs 13, for example, in verse 4, it says there, The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be rich. Our text that was just read for us talks about this idea of planting. And when you look at verse 4 and you realize the lazy man will not plow because of winter, it's an excuse. Well, here's what you need to know about winter. That's the rainy season. It's cold. It's nasty. You don't want to be out there having to plow that land and prepare it so that you can plant your crops. So the lazy man will stay inside and he'll stay close to the fire and he'll be warm there. Because you see the slugger or the lazy man will avoid discomfort. The muddy field. The wind in his face. The difficulty. The challenge. But yet when harvest comes, he's the first one out the door to head to the fields to be able to reap what has been planted only to be reminded by his own inactivity that there is nothing for which he can harvest. Without effort and advanced planning, there are few results that we can enjoy in this life. I said it in Bible class this morning, I'll say it again now, a failure to plan is a plan to fail. As children of God, God expects of us that we put forth diligence, not laziness. That we put forth effort or work, and I'll talk more about that in a few moments. And that we recognize that it is an expectation that is given to us. And the one who lacks, the one who desires, but never does, is the one that will never have. Or as it says in verse 4, will have nothing. So where did this problem come from? Laziness is part of our fallen nature. Laziness is an aspect of that state that we need to have rejuvenated, to grow out of. Six times the idea of the sluggard or the lazy man is mentioned. And over a dozen times the idea of slothfulness. A sloth. I think about that very interesting animal with its great claws on its feet and its forearms. It looks as if it barely moves. Talking to a care provider at a very large zoo, it fascinated me when I was told that they are moving at an exceptional pace. <laughs> for them as a species. And so, slothfulness as we look at it is slow and unaccomplishing. <laughs> the animal was made that way, but we're not. 
We are meant to be diligent. We are meant to be people of diligence. That we are to be the opposite of laziness. You may not recall this, but we did speak about this in Proverbs 10 verses 1 through 6 in a previous lesson. And in doing so, what I tried to point out was that laziness is always exposed. The article talks about that ant that works so diligently and is praised. That little tiny creature that is so vulnerable to the bigger parts of us in life, but yet it works with diligence. Laziness is always exposed unfavorably in Scripture. In chapter 21 of Proverbs, verse 25, it says, The desire of the lazy man kills him. It is because of the desires that he is seeking rather than doing what he is expected. For his hands refuse to labor. Those things that kill him, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Proverbs 23 and 7. There is a way which seems right to a man, but the way thereof leads to destruction. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. We can convince ourselves of anything, but we are not to think like the world. We are to think like our Father in heaven. And as we learn to think like Him, we begin to understand what John was trying to impose to us when he told us that the things of this world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, these things are not of the Father, but of the world. Verse 17 of that text says that the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. What is God's will then? It's not laziness. Why do you need this lesson this morning? Why do I need to preach it? Because I needed to hear it. Because we need to hear what God has to say about us not focusing on what He wants us to do. So that means that this morning and every day that God allows me to wake up and you, we are to discipline ourselves. But we don't like to be disciplined. Discipline must be built into our Christian lives. It's why we are looking at this entire series over the course of this year, strengthening our spiritual walk to know what we're not to do so that we know what to do. To find ways to do the things that are pleasing in God's eyes and those that are not. So this morning, I submit to you that we have been given a task, and that task is to go into all the world. Take the gospel to the lost, those that will listen, want to be baptized for the remission of their sins, baptize them, and we teach them. Then the rest of their days, we take the time, the energy, the commitment to teach them all things that Jesus has given to us. That's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came into the world to save the world, not destroy it. John 3 and verse 17. And so then we have to pick up the pace now. Jesus is left to prepare places for us, John 14 tells us. While he's away preparing, we are also preparing by adding to the kingdom and hopefully daily. He came for a people that would be eager to work. Titus 2 and verse 14. Therefore, we must be a people of diligence for the Lord. And I want to talk about three things that we need to avoid in the life of the lazy person, the sluggard, the slothful, however you want to say it, so that we can see what it is God wants from us and not become this lazy attitude that has grown like a cancer and has become malignant across our nation. We need to not let it come into the church. We need to make a difference while we go back out into the world. Show them what workers look like. Number one, we need to see then the nature of the slugger. For emphasis sake, verse four, 
The lazy man will not plow because of winter. He makes the excuse, it's cold, it's rainy, I don't want to get wet. He will beg during harvest and have nothing because he planted not. Laziness is as old as the humanity's sin. And when we begin to look at how God intended for us when He made man, Adam, when He made woman and placed him them there in the garden, Genesis 2 and verse 15 reminds me that He put them there, He put them in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Workers. We don't know how big it was. But even if it was like 10 acres, one person would be working from sunup to sundown. They would be diligent, have to be, all day long to get it done. Yet the moment that they disobeyed, the voice of the Maker said to the created, your penalty is death. And immediately they began to die physically and their spiritual connection with God was severed. And they would labor. And they would have pain. And they would have trials. And as a result of that, they would even be challenged with the tendency to become lazy with vocational work. Because that would be before them every day of their life. Genesis 3 and 17. Consequently, through the sweat of his brow and all of that, he would be able to produce Genesis 3 and verse 19, but it was going to take labor. But the opposite of the laborer is the sluggard, the lazy man, the slothful. The sluggard's nature is one of indolence or laziness. The word for sluggard or slacker is at sale in the original. Some lazy people will not work at all. Some will work, but they will not dedicate themselves to do what has been given to them properly. There's a common worldly expression for that, and I'm sure you know what it is. They only put half-heartedness into it. God is looking for the difference. The difference. The lazy man was not willing to work in unfavorable conditions. So he did one of two things. He foolishly sowed his seed without plowing the field. Do you remember back in Mark? In Mark chapter 4. Do you remember when Jesus gave the parable of the sower? Not the soils. Sower. We learn a great deal there about putting effort in and preparing properly and planting where we're supposed to plant. Because if we don't prepare and we don't plant where we're supposed to, we won't receive a harvest. So he will either foolishly sow his field without plowing it or he waited until weather was warmer and more pleasant, which would be the wrong time. There wouldn't be enough time for proper moisture. There would be too much sun. Palestine is a rocky area. They wouldn't have time to put down roots. You see the application to the New Testament. Laziness affects things going forward. Whatever you and I do today affects tomorrow. I'm 64 now, I'll be 65 in August. And I think about the things I did 30, 40, 50 years ago. They've had consequences all these years going forward. I'll give you a practical illustration. I was in the military, I was on jump status. You hit the ground enough times, hard enough, you get shorter. I've lost over two inches in height from when I went in the military. And my hips and my ankles hurt when it rains like that. So I empathize with all of you with arthritis this morning. 
consequences, you see. And so the sluggard's nature is one of impudence. It's almost high-handedness in the face of God. Because his lack of willpower is involved here. So laziness then is a matter of choice. We choose, you choose, I choose. Humanity chooses to be in rebellion to God. The impudence, the shameless laziness that what we do today has an effect on our future. The sluggard refuses to see that a missed opportunity is a lost opportunity. He just depends on others or she. And so I ask you this morning, what nature do you demonstrate? Is it the worker or the slugger? Is it the diligent or the lazy? In the New Testament, we look at the Greek word ergon. 176 times it's used in the New Testament. It can mean work, toil, effort, deed, or labor. To put forth one's own decision to do something. It's a principle of life. Duty today has consequences tomorrow. Nothing so today, nothing harvested in the future. It's about us realizing that whatever we do in our words or our deeds today will affect the tomorrows and the days to come. And do we put the effort in to do and speak everything for the glory of God, Colossians 3.17? Or are we allowing the tempter to confuse our minds and convince us, well, somebody else will do this and we'll be able to take benefit of it then. Laziness is going to be a challenge for the world going forward. Thus, we need to be reminded how important diligence really is. You and I are called by Jesus. Come, follow me. He says, if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. He's going to put us into the soul-seeking business. Not just to get men to follow you, but to follow Jesus. And that their soul is being prepared to be with Jesus forever. It's about us putting to death laziness. It's about us developing Strengthening our spiritual walk, diligence, and spiritual success in our lives. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 3, Endure hardness as a good soldier. In essence, friends, we're being called to follow the, the right way, not the easy way. Or as Jesus himself said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. The easy way. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. The right way. And there are few who find it. Laziness affects which path we're going to get on. Laziness affects whether or not we will have a future with the Lord in heaven. The message of the gospel, the message of the Bible, is that you and I learn to redeem the time because the days are evil. Ephesians 5 and verse 16. The gospel will expand that to now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. We've got to put that old nature away. We've got to gain the new nature as described in Colossians 3. Number two, the posture of the sluggard. The lazy man's posture is one of sinfulness. I want to look at five real quick, five proverbs that you will see the relevance to when I read them to you. 
The lazy man's posture is one of sinfulness. Proverbs 18 and verse 9 says, He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is the great destroyer. Great destroyer. That's a description of Satan if you don't know that. Man was created to work. And Satan will find mischief. Satan will find distraction. Satan will find something for the idle hands that are in this world to fill them up. I think about unemployment in the world today. You drive around, you see signs everywhere. We're hiring, we're hiring. If there's so many jobs available, why aren't people working? Well, laziness. They would rather get something for nothing than have some pride about themselves and put forth their own effort. Secondly, the lazy man's posture is one of sluggishness. Proverbs 19, verse 24. The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. This must be really important for us to learn from because it's repeated in chapter 26 and verse 15. And I'm not 100% sure if there's a full connection, but there is an example that we can look at. It's in 2 Kings 21 and verse 13. There, to show how he intends to judge Manasseh, this is recorded. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish. We just mentioned a dish here. Wiping it and turning it upside down, which means do not put anything in it. It's no longer in use. The language is a severity. The language is a finality. There is no tentativeness here on God's part. The sluggish man, the slacker, the lazy person will put their hand in the bowl with the food and they will not even lift their own hand to put it to their mouth. The lazy one, the sluggish one will be destroyed. Proverbs 21, verse 25 through 26. The lazy man's posture is one of selfishness. The desire of a lazy man, sluggard, put him to death, kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. He covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not spare. This means that the sluggard craves for rest, pleasure, and enjoyment, but refuses to work. There's nothing wrong with rest, pleasure, or enjoyment. But we are called to work. To honor God, if nothing else. As Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, if anyone will not work, neither shall we eat. You know, I thought, I thought about that verse ever since I heard it the first time when I was growing up on the farm. And I thought to myself, are they telling us that if we don't work, we don't get supper or breakfast? We worked hard when I was growing up. And it was an expectation of all of us to do our part. Number four, the lazy man's posture is one of spinelessness. Proverbs 22 and verse 13 says, The lazy man says, There is a lion outside. I shall be slain in the streets. There's also a statement of this similar kind in Proverbs 26 and verse 13. There's chaos, there's trouble, there's hardship, there's rejection in the world that is outside this building. 
in the communities where you live, in the minds of some of the people that you know. But being a coward, a lazy man, is not being bold for Christ. So we can stay hidden in our little churches, buildings. We can stay confined to our homes. But there's no going. There's no teaching. There's no baptizing. There's no teaching again. And if you just do the math over time, the kingdom population goes this way rather than upward the way it should be. We've got to be bold. We've got to be strong, not like the slugger. And we need to remember the lazy man's posture is one of senselessness. Proverbs 24, verse 30 and 31. I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stones, its stone wall was broken down. But Jesus teaches us. Jesus, not Paul. Jesus, not John, Matthew, Luke, or any of the other disciples. Jesus says that we are to bear much fruit. When I confront myself, now you are confronted with this five-dimensional picture are you not prone? Are you not done? Are you not motivated for diligence rather than laziness? We've got to learn that. We've got to discipline ourselves. We've got to develop ourselves for spiritual growth. This is a spiritual fitness plan. Sometimes you become weary. Some have even fallen asleep. The Hebrew writer tells us this in chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become, listen to it, sluggish. But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises Spiritual discipline enables you and I to be a servant of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11 and 12. Thirdly, and I'll close. The future of the slugger. The lazy man will not plow because of winter. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. Do you wake up in the morning and realize like I do I don't need coffee to get this realization. I'm a creature of eternity. So are you. I'll either spend eternity with God or I'm going to spend eternity with Satan. I'm going to either understand the joy of paradise or the torment of Tartarus, ultimately Gehenna. I realize that it's appointed unto me once to die, then the judgment. Hebrews 9 27. I realize that if I fail to plow today, work today, I'm affecting my future and my, my ability to provide for my Loretta. Notice how lazy living leads to bankruptcy. Nothing is more despicable than laziness. Lazy living leads to tragedy. Whether it's in time, right now, or eternity. To stand before Jesus and have nothing to offer. What tragedy that follows a life of laziness Depart from me, you who commit iniquity. 
It can either be the comparison of the gold and the silver and the precious stones of enduring worth that we have labored for God and His glory or it is the wood, the hay, and the stubble of nothingness. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 12. Here's the question before the final. What future are you planting for yourself? Is it eternity with Jesus or eternity with Satan? And you might think, whoa, whoa, you're just really out on a limb here by yourself. God is a graceful God. Yes, He is. Praise God. But listen, we can convince ourselves of a lot of things. It's His way. Or it's Satan's. Laziness will destroy us. Therefore, are you a people of diligence for the Lord? Or are you lazy? We look how laziness has a nature, a posture, and a future. If we can make this personal application, my dad told me this story. He said, on the ships that he would go to sea on, they would get these new deck officers. They were young. They were determined to show that they could command the ship. But they would do it their way. They wanted to prove that they were able and that they did not need someone to tell them how to do it. And yet I'm reminded now in my later years that I read in Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. The way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. This book I have my hand on, that Bible in your lap, Psalm 119 verse 105 reminds us that God's Word is a lamp unto our feet. You want to know how to get to Jesus and eternity? Hold the lamp close so you can see where your path is and stay on it. Don't deviate left or to the right. Proverbs 4, 26 and 27. Make sure that you follow the light. Because that line is like a lighthouse to ships. When the light is on, it is letting all ships coming near. That that is too close to the shore. It's dangerous. The light continues to beam. And ships that ignore that wind up destroyed. Rather than us going on to that which destroys, follow the light. Be diligent to follow the light. Follow the path that Jesus has set. Trust in Him with your faith. Repent if you're a sinner. Make it known that He is the Son of God and you follow only Him. If you've never been born again of water and the Spirit, do so. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Then live faithfully as a diligent child of God, not a lazy man. Let us not try to fight God and defy His authority so that we can prove we don't need anybody to tell us how to do it. Let's follow God's way. Amen? You need to do that. Why don't you come as together we stand and sing? Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere He leads me in this world below. Anywhere with a thousand nearest doors would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere. Jesus, I am not alone. Father, Christ, I will be.
Slides of leaders from five to seven, uh, and dinner will be served for all those who are participating and volunteers. Uh, just a few updates. Uh, we have good news that uh, Thelma Miller is home from the hospital, so that's an answer to prayer. Uh, also, Henry Weinwald has uh, contracted COVID, so for now there'll be uh, no visitors for Harry. And also, uh, please. Pray for Eileen Casera. Um, her brother has passed away and she's gone to West Virginia for the memorial. Uh, that's all the updates I have this morning. If you could please stand and join me for a closing prayer. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we come before you in awe this morning. We thank you for this opportunity we have to sing and praise your power and to worship you here with the saints in Sanford. We thank you for your grace, for pouring out your favor on us. Father, may we put all our trust in you, that, that you would lead us in the path of righteousness. Lord, we ask for your blessings this week, that we would glorify you in all that we do. We pray that we would be good servants in your kingdom and that you would help us to be good stewards of the blessings you give us. Please help us to be salt and light in our community. Father, we pray that in all that we do, we would submit to your will. We ask that you forgive us when we fail you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 